In this lesson, we're going to take a closer look at virtual local area networks, known as VLANs. We create VLANs by configuring a physical layer two switch into multiple virtual switches. These virtual switches each form their own broadcast domain. Let's look at how this works. By default, every port on a layer two switch belongs to the same broadcast domain. This means if one host on this LAN sends a packet to the switch, the switch replicates or broadcasts the packet to all the other active ports on the switch. To create VLANs, you need to assign individual ports on a switch to the broadcast domain you want. Let's keep it simple and say that you want a VLAN for the sales department and a VLAN for the engineering department. You can create a VLAN for each department by assigning the hosts in the sales department to VLAN 2 and the hosts in the engineering department to VLAN 20. This isolates each department's hosts to their own virtual network, meaning they won't see the traffic from the other's VLAN. Each VLAN will also have their own MAC address table in this case, but we'll discuss that a little bit later. Now, if a host in the sales department tries to send a packet to an IP address on the engineering subnet, it won't work because communication between VLANs can only happen on layer three. To get around this limitation, you could add a router to one of the switch's ports and configure it to route data between the subnets. Or you could use a layer three switch, which provides both switching and routing functions. Then the routing would occur internally. Okay, now let's expand our example a bit. Imagine you also have members of the sales department whose offices aren't physically close to the other sales team members. In this case, these members would be connected to a different physical switch, but they could still be configured to be part of VLAN 2. The same is true if you had members of the engineering department connected to a different switch than the first group of engineers. The physical switches can be connected through their VLANs. To do this, you'd configure the second sales team's ports to VLAN 2 and second group of engineers' ports to VLAN 20. For example, let's say that Jeff in sales sends data to Kim in engineering. The packet would go to the VLAN 2 port that Jeff's computer is connected to. The switch would then forward the packet to the router, which would then forward the packet to VLAN 20. Next, the switch would look at the MAC address in the frame and forward the packet to the next switch. Finally, the packet would arrive at Kim's computer. In this example, you can see that each VLAN has a separate connection to the router, and the connections from the switches to each VLAN are separate as well. This becomes very cumbersome if you have a lot of VLANs. The solution to this is trunk porting. A trunk port is a port configuration that allows multiple VLANs, in this case, both VLAN 2 and VLAN 20, to connect through a single port. It keeps each VLAN's traffic in its own lane. Trunk ports are also called tagged ports. The ports that allow traffic from only one VLAN are called access or untagged ports. For trunk ports to be able to manage traffic from multiple VLANs or broadcast domains, the packets from each VLAN are tagged in the header to show which VLAN they're from. This open standard for layer two frames is called 802.1Q. This means that if a packet tagged for VLAN two comes to a port, it's only forwarded through VLAN 2 ports, and so on. 802.1Q also lets you configure one of the VLANs as the default VLAN for any time a packet comes to a trunk port untagged. This chosen default VLAN is called the native VLAN, and any untagged packets end up being associated with it. Let's look at that packet being sent from Jeff to Kim again. Only this time, let's go with trunk ports and tagging. When the packet reaches the trunk port from Jeff's workstation in VLAN 2, it's given the VLAN tag of 2 in the header, so that when it reaches the router, it knows that the packet came from VLAN 2. It's tagged again at each trunk port it traverses until it reaches Kim's workstation. As technology evolved to meet the demands of businesses, phones were developed to use internet technology. This is called Voice over Internet Protocol, or VoIP for short. Because many office workstations are only equipped with one port, VoIP phones were designed with two. One port is used to connect to a user's computer, while the other is used to connect to the LAN, which uses an access port. Know that you should prioritize VoIP traffic if you want to ensure sound quality, but there's a problem with setting up priorities like this. Access ports only allow traffic from one LAN, and you have data packets and voice packets coming in on the same port. Fortunately, the VoIP phone manufacturers anticipated this problem and built in the ability to tag all voice traffic with its own VLAN tag. In this scenario, your job would be to use an auxiliary VLAN configuration 
to allow VoIP traffic to be tagged with its own VLAN and then configure PC traffic to be the native VLAN. This changes the access port to another trunk port so that the native VLAN becomes a data VLAN. Now that we've gone over VLAN's physical topology, let's make sure we understand how packets are addressed to the correct destination. This is done through MAC address tables, ARP tables, and Neighbor Discovery Protocol, or NDP. Let's start with how MAC address tables are created. We know that every network hardware device has a unique identifier, which is a 48-bit number known as the MAC address. This number is used in networking to know where a packet came from and where to send it. Switches create tables in the LAN that are populated with MAC addresses. When you subdivide a switch into VLANs, each VLAN then behaves as if it's an independent switch and creates its own MAC address table. You do this by adding the MAC address of the device sending a packet to the MAC address table. This information is in the source MAC address tag within the header, which also includes a destination MAC address. If the switch doesn't already have the destination MAC address stored in its table, it broadcasts the packet to all the ports in its broadcast domain, except the port that sent the packet. The correct port responds and its MAC address is added to the MAC address table. All other devices dismiss the broadcast. The switch also enters the port associated with each MAC address in the table. The MAC address table entries are temporary and are repopulated on a regular basis as packets continue to traverse the switch. Also, note that MAC addresses are in the header of the frame and used at the data link layer or second layer of the OSI model. The acronym ARP stands for Address Resolution Protocol. At the network layer level or layer three level, ARP creates its own table for keeping track of each packet's IP address it receives at a gateway. MAC addresses are unchanging, but IP addresses change a lot. When a packet comes to a gateway with a destination address, the gateway uses ARP to establish the MAC address that matches the IP address. It links the two together and stores them in a table, which is a temporary cache. This cache is updated every few minutes because IP addresses change so frequently. This table is built in a similar way to a MAC table. When a device requests a MAC address that can be used to send a packet to another workstation in the VLAN, the router or layer three switch checks its ARP cache for that connection. If it's already there, the router forwards the packet to the intended destination. If it's not, a broadcast is sent out to all devices in the VLAN requesting network addresses. When the intended address responds, its IP address is stored in the cache. This ARP feature only works on IPv4 though. If you use IPv6, you actually use the Neighbor Discovery Protocol, or NDP, for address resolution at the network layer. NDP works by sending IPv6 ICMP messages to discover other devices on the same interface. NDP provides some improvements to ARP, such as layer two address recognition for neighbors on the same VLAN, as well as the recording of IP address changes on VLAN devices. The discovery process is like the ARP process, and once two devices in a VLAN connect, the other computer's IP and MAC address are recorded on their own neighbor cache. Another concept to understand has to do with an algorithm we see used with all half duplex devices. This algorithm is called Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Detection, or CSMA CD. It's basically a protocol that senses if a data channel is already in use and then prescribes the steps for trying to resend the transmission. The steps it goes through are to send a jam signal, wait for a random amount of time, and then attempt to send the frame again. The process repeats itself until the transmitting station senses no other signals in the channel and sends the packet. The final concept we'll cover today concerns the cables you use when you physically connect devices. An Ethernet cable's connector and port have transmission pins and receiving pins. The cable's transmission pins have to connect to the port's receiving pins and vice versa. An Ethernet port's connection is called a medium-dependent interface, or MDI. This interface is not only comprised of the physical connection, but it also includes the configured electrical connection. A medium-dependent interface crossover, or MDIX, is an interface in which the transmission and receiving pins are in opposite positions. This setup allows a straight-through cable to connect devices in situations where one port is an MDI and the other is an MDIX. PCs usually have MDI ports, and switches and hubs usually have MDIX ports. If you have devices with the same interface, such as MDI for both ports, 
you can use a crossover cable to connect the transmission and receiving pins. Fortunately, Auto MDIX was developed to make these connections easier by detecting the needed cable connection type and automatically configuring the connection. When Auto MDIX is enabled on either end of a link, the transmission works with either straight through or crossover cables. Just be sure to also set the interface speed and duplex to auto for Auto MDIX to work properly. That's it for this lesson. In this lesson, we covered a lot of information about VLANs. We looked at how switches are subdivided into subnets and how we can extend switches to include additional devices on a VLAN. We discussed trunk ports, access ports, and tagging. Then we talked about how to further subdivide a VLAN to utilize VoIP. We went over MAC addresses, ARP, and NDP tables, and how they're built. We finished this lesson by going over how we avoid data collisions through CSMACD and how Auto MDIX can help make it easier when we use cables to connect devices on a network. If you implement these VLAN features correctly, you can do a whole lot to keep your traffic protected and your network running smoothly.